If you make someone else's happiness, whatever, more important than your own, you will yeah. become enmeshed. When we realize that we are codependent or enmeshed, we're like horrified. Just, you know, clutch your pearls. <laughs> because if we all are imperfect, then what is the difference of an imperfect person that is doomed? So I've made all of the mistakes every other human woman has made in relationships. Not on my watch. That's what that game is. You crazy as hell. I wish that everyone was like this. Anyway. Hey, Mom. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing, Miss Lady? I'm fabulous. It's a great, beautiful day. Are you familiar with uh, Iyanla Vincent? I am. I love her. I know. I love her, too. She's also a Virgo like us. Oh, I didn't know she was a Virgo. I thought you would literally love that. Oh, I know. That makes sense, though. Yes, so I knew you would live for the fact that she's a Virgo. But I'm excited to talk to her. And I think it was so interesting because she started out, I think she was saying she started in 88. But then obviously I think the world really became, you know, started to really know about her when it came to her um, being on Oprah's show uh, from 98 to 99. And then obviously she's become become even more wildly popular to my generation because of her show, Iyala Fix My My Life, which we have a million and one memes with online. (laughs) But the reason why I was thinking about about it in this way is because she started in 88 it's now 2023 and I feel like the conversation around therapy has changed so much obviously I feel like she's played a really good part in bringing that to the mainstream media as well as bringing it to black American media absolutely absolutely I want to know what your thoughts on therapy were when you were a young adult like like how often did you hear about it what what did you think of it and did you ever consider going so i grew up in a small town outside of chicago called robbins and it was a very spiritual you know christian community like we had more churches than anything and i think early on that's what i was raised to do was pray like mm-hmm. pray your problems away you know um god is listening So, and I'm very thankful for that. The gift that my mother, you know, gave me of prayer and meditation and, you know, just being in solitude. But when my father died, um, my father died from cancer and he, he was like bedridden for two years. My mother went to counseling. And I remember hearing her saying that she was going to a therapist. And I remember asking her, why are you going something wrong with you? Because like, I was afraid, oh my God, my father's dying. Now my mother's, what's going on? And she says, no, I'm going to talk to someone to help me. And so that was the first time that I even heard of somebody talking to somebody other than a pastor or a reverend or something. And so that stuck with me. Interesting. Now, considering what, what, so they, the, the concept was like therapy is for rich white folks. But when did that, I mean, you obviously experienced it for a particular reason when it was came to yeah. death and, and health in your family. But then what what happened as time changed for you? Your com- I mean, I know, well, I guess I can even start with me. I remember when I was 17, obviously I had been telling you guys, talking to you guys for years about the stress of the industry and yeah. how it was just so much on me. And, you know, you guys would give me advice or you guys would, you know, do what you could but I really felt isolated and really alone. I remember when I was 17, I said, guys, I need to go to therapy. What were you thinking when I said that? Um, You know, what I was thinking was when you would tell me, um, first of all, what I love about you is that you always are about self-care, self-help. Like if you have a problem or you have an issue, you are, you will do the work. You're the type of person that will read and research and you'll figure out, okay, why am I feeling this way? So I knew that for you to keep talking about it, that it was something that was, you know, serious for you. And I think what I thought was you were having stress from being in the industry. So just quit the industry. Just quit it. Like if you having all these problems and it's bothering you, then quit it. And I remember you telling me, but I love it. And that's not the answer, mom. The answer isn't quit what you love. Because it's stressing you out a bit. Yeah, I'm still, I love it. I'm just trying to manage it. 
But yeah. I mean, and when you said that, then that just was like, it made sense to me, you know? And I was like, yeah, she needs management. And sometimes that doesn't, that can't come from your parents. It needs to come so from the So were you afraid of the therapy at first? Like, were you spooked? Like, did you feel like, what is this? How do this do this? Because I know at first, I know I initially said, hey, I want to go to therapy. And then I said, I want y'all to go to therapy with me. Okay, so that, that the thing with that is, Let's let me answer the first part, which is was I concerned? Absolutely, I was concerned about you going to therapy because you were so young. And I'm a very, you know, skeptical person. And I'm like, I have read so many horror stories of young girls going to talk to therapists. And if it's not the right therapist, if it's not the right person, then they can take you on a whole roller coaster ride of emotions and and, and not help you. So Yes, I was concerned, not that you were going, but that we could find the right person, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to really shop and research and find the right person that's going to be, that's going to help you versus send you off on a whole nother roller coaster. So that's first. Mm -hmm. Now, about us going to therapy. Look, I was, your father and I were always willing to do whatever it took for all of our kids to be comfortable, to feel confident and to do whatever. So no, I never did have a problem with you wanting us to go to therapy as a family. I just never did want to disappoint you because everybody's at a different place in their lives. And yeah. you can say, Hey, I want my family to go to therapy. But if your brother isn't ready to go to therapy or your mother isn't ready to go to therapy, now you're forcing a situation and who knows right. what can happen. And I think that's so, that's, you know, that's true what you're saying, but it also is difficult because I think in my mind, I was just thinking, which again, I'm a, I was in a kid's mind, you know, in my, in my adolescent mind, I was thinking, well, I still got to live with these people. Right. So I don't want to be working on myself. Right. And then we're not, you know, I'm coming back home and we're still having this, I'm being triggered and re-triggered and, so in my mind, I was thinking, well, if we do this together, if we do this united, then we can all because I already felt that way anyway. I felt like so often I would be on the road and I would be having such extreme experiences and then I would come back home and nobody really could relate to them. You know, maybe you could or whoever, which parent came with me, but we weren't always doing all these experiences together. So I felt like here I was about to embark on this you know, healing journey, this introspective journey about what we all were traumatized by which right, was the right. fame and the popularity of my career right and I was just like so badly wanting you guys to be able to come with me and um I just remember that it was weird that first time it was okay it was always weird when we did group therapy but then I remembered <laughs> when we when you guys started doing individual therapy like y'all right. would randomly tell me you know or you yeah. would randomly tell me like oh yeah I had a, I talked to a therapist the other day what yeah. when did it become something for you that you wanted to seek out yourself? Well, for it came, became something for me that I wanted to seek out for myself when we were moving, when um we went through a transitional phase where you went to Atlanta. We didn't want to go to Atlanta. Larry and I didn't want to go. We didn't want to start over again in a whole new place. So it was just a very stressful time. And it was also what what are we doing? What's the decisions? What are we making? And I just needed to talk to someone who was just could listen. You know, sometimes you just want to talk to somebody and just like just talk and then just get it all out and then just see what what they're going to say. You know what I mean? So I talked to someone and the person that I spoke to was very kind and very much listened to me didn't give me any uh, advice, right or wrong, just really listen to me. And mm -hmm. so I found that refreshing, you know, that people wasn't forcing opinions on me or what they wanted. Um, I also learned um, peace be still. You know, sometimes when you don't have anything to do and you're still, there's nothing wrong with that. But society and especially in the entertainment industry, you're you're made to believe that if you're being still, if nothing is going on, then you're a failure. Yeah. You know, something. Yeah, I think a lot of times that's work culture. Work culture is so, yeah. 
hustle, 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 do, 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 do. But when you're working on yourself, so much of that takes calm and patience and silence and just it's a totally different approach. Um, and then you also know I love to take baths, you know. I love to take baths because while in my while I'm taking my bath, I pray, you know, I have my um, you know, moment where I can talk to God and, you know, and just ask for forgiveness, you know, I'm not a perfect mm-hmm. person, you know, ask for forgiveness, ask him to guide me. You know, my favorite prayer, I say, God, you know, help me, guide me, help me to speak when I'm supposed to speak, help me to be mm-hmm. quiet when I'm supposed to be quiet, help me to hear what it is you want me to hear so that I can do your will, you know? Yeah. To be really, truly of service. I think that's also, you know, that the, 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 when you come from it from a spiritual sense, I think something that's becoming really apparent with me is the unconditional love that God has for me is the unconditional love that I need to have for myself. And um, that's only going to come from me pouring into me. And the more that I'm pouring into me, the more that I'm loving me, the more that I'm in turn also loving God because I'm honoring myself. And it I don't know, it's 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 it's, it's a lot that comes from it. And sometimes it can come at you from a ton of a, a ton of bricks. So I did love what you said earlier about how sometimes therapy can open up stuff and you're just like, now I got all this shit that I done unpacked. How I'm about to fold all these clothes and put them back into the suitcase. Exactly. But it does it does end up coming back around at some point. So I, I know I got to get to Iyanla. I could talk to you about this all day as usual. I thank you so much, Mom. Awesome. Um, and I can't wait to, to talk to you the next time. Awesome. Talk to you later. This is Kiki. I can't wait to get into it with my guest today. And I know she has so much wisdom to offer, okay? There is nothing that this person cannot do, okay? She is a six-time New York Times bestselling author, former lawyer, I'm already so excited, ordained minister, and host of her own podcast, The R Spot. You might know her from her frequent appearances on The Oprah Winfrey Show or her critically acclaimed TV show, which I never missed an episode, Fix My Life. Y'all have fixed my life, okay? It is such a privilege to have her here with me today. Please welcome Iyanla Van Zandt. Thank you, my beloved. How are you? Iyanla, I cannot tell you how much I love you. I'm just so excited to be speaking with you because, you know, when we talk about just therapy, um, fixing your life, healing yourself, a lot of times we don't have diversity in that space. And I really do look to you as someone that has been just such an icon as, of showing us the many faces of what therapy self-help looks like. Um, and also grounded in a, in a way that it doesn't feel so away from you and so kind of um, robotic. It, it all, it feels real. Like, you know, you still feel like a real person whenever you're talking about these topics. Um, and, and I mean, I could jump in with you really at any point, but I guess I'll start there with, you know, your approach is very specific to you. How did you decide to keep that personal aspect? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Yes. And let me say what a thrill and an honor it is for me to be with you. You know, I have watched you grow up, <laughs> grew up before our eyes to become this icon, really. Oh. Our baby girl growing up, I have loved you and prayed for you and held you you for a long, long time. So it's an honor for me to be here. One of the things that I learned um, when I was training to be a coach back Mm -hmm. in 1988, were you born then? Nope, (laughs) in 1993. (laughs) With the father of coaching, Thomas Leonard, Mm was the principle of authenticity. Just be who you are. You know, I learned coaching skills. I learned coaching principles. I learned um, coaching pre-conversations. Then when I became a lawyer, I learned how to structure those conversations and how to use skills and tools to present a certain thing. Mm. And I've always endeavored to be authentic so that I didn't have to remember anything. Because I knew one day I would get to where I am now, old. <laughs> yeah. When you get old, you can't remember a lot of stuff. <laughs> so you just be who you are um, and craft the skills, the tools, the gifts, the talents 
to match who you are inside, what you do on the outside, it'll just resonate authentically. You're a Virgo, right? Young. Absolutely. Wouldn't be anything else. Totally okay, out. girl. Me too. <laughs> Me too. And I really, I mean, I know it's about so much more than signs, but I, I just say that as a connector because I've always known that about you and lived for that about you. But I really do relate to the to what you're saying on authenticity. And I remember I was having a, ther- a conversation with my therapist about uh, some kind of, um, I don't know who did it, but somebody was doing kind of a, a, a vibration, like a research on the vibrations, you know, of love, of, you know, happiness, of joy, jealousy, fear, whatever. And, you know, it was pretty much expected that the lower vibrations would be more of the negative emotions and the higher vibrations, would, you know, in the highest would be love. But the highest was actually authenticity. So when you when you spoke to that about authenticity, um, you know, that just really jumped out at me because, you know, it, it's just so much, it may, It just is so much easier when you're coming from this place of just being you, because like you said, you don't have to really think about too much, but it can be difficult sometimes to actually find um, what's authentic. Because when I was having this conversation with my therapist, it was actually being springboarded off of the idea of why do we put ourselves into such unique situations, right? Like how do we find ourselves in these places? And I think ultimately she was coming from this place, from this um, perspective of, it gets us to the place of being authentic. We experience things so that we can continue to know our boundaries, know, you know, know what it is we need, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm curious to ask you, what was that, what was the the jumping point for you in your life where you said, um, or where you started to really get it to how to really step into your authenticity? I think she may have been referring to Power Versus Force by David Hawkins. Yes. And the chart of of uh, the ray of emotions. For me, uh, people lied to me all my life. My mother died when I was two, and they conveniently forget to forgot to tell me. I was raised um, thinking one woman was my mother who wasn't, wow. and I was about thirty when all of this truth fell upon me, and my whole life was a lie. People have made choices and decisions for me that I didn't participate in. People decided what they thought was best for me, what was right for me. And when I had that experience, I decided that I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to be true to myself. And at 30, I didn't even know who I was because, of course, I thought I was one person and I was somebody else. So that was it Mm -hmm. for me, just... Understanding the depth and damage that inauthenticity, dishonesty, lying, you know, can mm-hmm. do and what it did to yeah. me. And even in my false identity, I wasn't authentic. I was like everybody else, trained and programmed to be who other people wanted me to be, needed me to be, thought I should be. Yeah. So we all that kind of deprogramming and dismantling. But when your inauthentic self is built on a lie, oh my God, it's even worse. I love what you said about that because I don't think anybody walks around thinking I'm being inauthentic. Right. You know, <laughs> most people are assuming that they're at least activating from, you know, themselves from some level of authenticity. And that's why when I was having this conversation, it was, it made me have so much um, compassion. <laughs> yes. For my experience is because of ultimately where they're getting me and how they're teaching me about myself and what they're going to help me learn. Now, another thing that I was really curious, because we talk about self-help, we talk about therapy. That's like the most pop, one of the most popular forms. We talk about yoga, but there's so many different versions of um, therapy and help that you can give to yourselves. You are a certified hypnotherapist. I'm very, I've always been extremely curious on what that is and what is the process of that. Hypnotherapy is really... It's a form of conversation, believe it or not. Really? You know, our being and our essence and our energy is based on vibration. It's based on energy. Hypnotherapy is a version of conversation that uses the essence, the energy, the vibration of the voice. You know, all of us are made of energy. We're made of frequency. We're made of vibration. And it's really becoming more prominent and understood here in the 21st century. 
But in hypnotherapy, mm. you use the tone, the tenor, the vibration of your voice to match the tone, the tenor, the energy of someone's mind. And then the tone, the tenor, the energy of your voice, the first instrument, leads that person's mind into a state of relaxation, into a state of compliance. Wow. And so um, my voice is one of my gifts. It sure is. (laughs) The melody of it, the tone of it, the tenor of it. And so I really studied hypnotherapy to understand the dynamics of conversation and communication. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Everything begins with a conversation, beloved. I I don't care what it is, whether you're buying a house or dating or negotiating in the bank, it's a conversation. So if you can have a conversation, understanding the tone, the tenor, the frequency of your voice, and tap into the mental and emotional energy of another person, you can lead them where you want them to go. Oh my goodness. And when then what how does that tie into the freedom emotional? Your your I'm sorry, I want to get the name right, but what you call it is emotional the freedom emo- Yeah, what how does that tie into that? Well, you know, I am a spiritual um technician. So I have studied many, many, many technologies, tools principles, applications that support us in building our spirit. Mm -hmm. Emotional freedom technique uses the voice, uses sound to give people the opportunity to move energy through their body. And they use their own voice and acupressure points, acupressure points on the body. People will go to the acupuncturist. Uh, Now, you know, there's another art, Twina where you use certain energy points on your body. Well, emotional freedom technique is self-administered acupuncture with no needles. So as you're speaking, you use certain energy points, pressure points on your body to release the energy. Because what causes illness, what causes breakdown is energy. And how do we usually transmit energy? Through our words and through our thoughts. So if you're holding on to a traumatic experience, we can use tapping and your own voice to move that energy through your body and hopefully out your body. Yeah. Now, that's interesting to me because I had just watched this movie recently called The Tale. Have you seen it or heard of it? No. No. Oh, my gosh. So this movie is starring Laura Dern, and it's about her. She's like a documentary person, or I forget exactly what her job is, but um you know, we find her in this story. She's 50. She's getting ready to be married. And her mom is like, I found your letters. What, what is all of this? And she's like, mom, why are you reading my stuff? What about the, what what is this thing with Tom or whatever the man's name is? And she's like, mom, that was a relationship that was very special to me. Like, you know, this is a very special time in my life. Don't read my letters. Don't read my, don't read my, my stories. You know, that's, that's my stuff. And as the movie goes on, Obviously, the Laura Dern character gets curious and she starts reading the letters herself. And she remembers this was a relationship that she'd had when she was young um, with her, um, you know, horse training coach. And this was she was like, you know, we're watching it and we go back into these flashbacks and we see a version of her that looks like about 16 years old or so having a relationship with, you know, what, you know, is looking like a budding relationship with a, a very adult man. And so when she goes back to her mom's home to actually start looking at the letters again, she realizes that she was like, oh, yeah, 75. There I am. And her mom's like, no, honey, this happened in 73 when you were 13. So then the movie regurgitates back and we now see her much younger, much, you know, like she's literally a 13 year old girl having a relationship with this 40 year old man. And so the course of the movie is about her repression and also her reframing of this relationship where she had told herself she was in this romantic relationship with this man when really she was groomed and really being abused. And that movie, it really was so triggering to me just in, in, in the thought as a human being that we could have told ourselves so many different stories and reframe so many different things and repress so many memories that we don't even know that are affecting us today. Um, And so I'm curious in your experience from working with people, 
how just how often is that really? Like, you know, have you ever experienced talking to somebody and it's like y'all come upon something that they didn't even, you know what I mean? Like, is that does it really happen that dramatically? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What? Because you gotta understand that. Um, I I had a, a conversation with a woman a few days ago who was uh violated by her brother. Wow. Uh she was it happened between the time that she was seven and ten. And he was 19 and it was repetitive and it was someone she knew. And because she had an emotional connection to him, there was no violence. There was the secrecy and there was the, the conflict of knowing what I'm doing is wrong, but wanting to make my brother happen, happy, Uh wanting him to like me. And then just because we're human, the natural physical response, of course, feel good of whatever that was. And the way she dealt with that was patting herself. And then when she did reveal it to her parents, they threw the brother out of the house. So he's gone out of her life. And then they never said another word about it. What do you mean by patting herself? What is patting herself? She mean? gained weight. She was tremendously obese. And in she, what ways is that? To, to push it off of her because she made up that it was her fault. For, she forgot all about the three years of rape and abuse. Wow. She forgot all about the fact that this was her brother she was trying to please. And she made it her fault that her brother got kicked out of the house. Well, let's dig into that too, right? Let's dig into the making other people's shit your fault. Okay. Um, and, and It's common because it is. If, you're, if you're a child, everything is about you. The world is about you between the ages of birth and probably around nine. Every, everything is your fault. Everything is about you. And then you want everybody's attention. You are the center because that's just how you're developing. You're growing into that identity. So until you get to be about nine or 10, you don't really get, oh, it's not all about me. There are other people too. Wherever that comes from, right? Whether it's from a situation like the person that you were just speaking of, or it's from Whatever the unique experiences that could be that could make someone end up taking on other people's stuff. I want to just talk to you about the danger of that in relationships, right? If you've if you've created a habit of, you know, someone else's stuff becoming my stuff, how do you separate that enmeshment when it's time for you to have a personal relationship with someone? Good word, enmeshment. <laughs> <laughs> Enmeshment, which is the birth, which is the brainchild of codependence. Right. <laughs> if you need somebody else to make you happy, if you make someone else's happiness whatever more important than your own, you will yeah. become enmeshed. And most human beings are codependent until mm-hmm. they create clear boundaries, until you begin to understand your value, your worth. Until you get that your life is your own and you have a right to create, to decide, to determine, to choose what matters to you. And it all happens, you know, when we realize that we are codependent or enmeshed, we're like horrified, you know, clutch your pearls. Oh, my God. (laughs) But it's a natural part of maturing and developing. You know, mothers are codependent on their kids. Kids are codependent on their mothers. Sometimes partners are codependent. And you you start making the other person, and it's the behaviors. It's the behavior. You don't call me on my stuff. I won't call you on your stuff. Um, I'll make you happy so that you don't come after me. It's the behaviors that keep us codependent. Yeah, And we'll be that way until it doesn't work anymore. Well, then, so then the question then lies, you know, and maybe the answer is that you can't, but when you love someone, I imagine, like you said, I love the the language you're using because it's so non-judgmental because when we love people, I feel like it's natural and, and 
fine to a certain extent to want to help them, but at some point it becomes incorrect. So how do you actually help the people that you love without it be, being an enmeshment scenario? Like how do you know what is actually helping someone you love and what is actually putting them at a disadvantage? Like what is the difference between those two things? Number one, I think the first keynote that you look for is, is this hurting me? Am I hurting myself to save them? That's always a no-no, always a no-no. And the second thing is, and this is a little more difficult to determine sometime, am I doing for them what they need to do for their self? Oh. And you know how we get make the distinction, helping versus supporting. When we love someone, we want to help them be better. But helping them keeps you tied to the outcome. So that if they succeed, chances are they forget all about you. And if they fail, it's your fault. That's help. Mm -hmm. When we learn how to support, and the distinction is when you're supporting someone, you do what they ask you to do, not what you think needs to be done. When you're helping, you do what you think they need. And nine times out of 10, if they didn't ask you for it or it fails, then they blame you and beat you up. And then you feel unappreciated, taken advantage of, manipulated. Ain't nobody asked you to do that. Learn how to support people, which means do what you need, what they, what they ask you to do to the degree that it doesn't cost you more or hurt you more than you're helping, than you're supporting them. And no place in this society Kiki, do they teach us that? In yeah. fact, particularly as women, we're taught that our measure is in the depths of sacrifice we make for other people. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. They do. Yeah. They they actually equate it to like the feminine way, which I'm so a person that does not really abide by gender real rules or gender norms because every woman isn't the same, every man isn't the same. But it is so interesting how that affects. That affects cultural dynamics, or excuse me, that affects the culture and the dynamics in relationships when yes. we continuously see things from that point of view. I mean, I'm curious with you and all the knowledge that you have, what has what how has that been useful in your personal relationships or your romantic relationships? Because you're very seems like you're a person that is healed, that is always working on healing. Um, you know, you're clear on so so much, but I know that you I, from what I know, you're divorced, you're not in relationships. I'm curious on how your knowledge has af affected your view of partnership. You know exactly. what I mean? You know, I, I mean, I'm curious and I'm curious on, on it from a personal standpoint, because um, my, my my thoughts on, on relationships have gone so many different ways, you know, throughout my life, you know, from seeing my parents have a wonderful marriage, um, they're still married to this day, but also not really meeting people that were similar to my father um, or being in scenarios where a lot of people can't handle that I've done so much of the work, right? So I, I've been successful so, so long and um, most people my age have not had the experiences I've had. So that creates a difference there. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm just... I'm really curious when you are not a woman that fits into the concept of what things are supposed to be, how does that impact and change your view of what relationships can be for you? Well, let me just say I am human. So I've made all of the mistakes every other human woman has made in relationships. In fact, you know, my, my philosophy is relationships are life's classroom. That's where we go to learn. That's mm -hmm. where, that's how we learn who we are as women, what works for all men. I can't speak. I don't remember right. being a man in this body, but I learned um, everything I needed to know. I identified and cleaned up all my issues. I was a daddyless daughter. So I had all manner of uh, issues related to acceptance and value and worth. Um, my father was emotionally unavailable. So my first partner, or that I stayed with for 40 years, married twice, uh, was emotionally unavailable. You right. know, I spent my whole time with him trying to figure out how to please him and get his approval that I could never get because mm -hmm. I never got my daddy's approval. 
So I was looking for something, A, that I no longer needed, B, mm. didn't know I was looking for, and C, didn't need, didn't want it anyhow. So the um, no longer needed, the no longer, I know, I want to hear the rest of what you're saying, but the no longer needed, I think is so huge because so many times when we're holding on to traumas of the past, we don't realize that we don't need, whatever that was, that's gone. Yes. You don't need that anymore. So instead of looking for that in the future, because you, 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 don't, you don't need it and it's not going to happen, look for what you need right now, how to move forward from that point. Here's the thing, Kiki. Most of us are not current in the way we approach our lives. We're stuck at the age that the breakdown occurred. Oh. So if the breakdown occurred at seven and you haven't neutralized that part of your, your consciousness, that aspect of your consciousness. That seven-year-old is still in there trying to get what it didn't get or overcome what happened or protect itself from what it experienced at that age. Most of us are not current in our consciousness and we're still trying to satisfy the broken pieces of ourselves. Now, where do you hear that on CNN, NBC, Fox? Or you don't hear that kind of talk. <laughs> and it's not addressed in the public school system. So many people have a five-year-old running their life mm. or a nine-year-old or a 13-year-old. So we have to learn how to bring those pieces current. So we're current in our identity, current in our purpose, current in our vision, current in our approach. Most of us are living, you know, we're not living in current events. We're living but in- But how can you do that, right? Like how, what is the checks and balance of that, because if I'm a person that that doesn't know, then how can I know what I don't know, right? You know, if you're a person listening to this podcast and you're, you know, you assume I'm pretty good, you know, I'm talking to you right now, I say, I feel pretty good, but ain't nobody really all the way good. What is the checks and balance of knowing that mm, maybe there's something there? Repetitive experiences, number Ooh. one. If you keep having the same relationship or you keep having the same experience, if you because it's you, boo, it's all about mm -hmm. you. The relationships you attract are going to reflect your internal landscape. So you're going to continue. To, and what we do as people, we make it about them. Oh, I'm not dating no more. Every man, every woman cheats or everybody takes advantage of me. Nobody understands me. We make it about the other person instead of saying, wait a minute, hold up. When I look in the mirror, I'm seeing a reverse of myself. My right is my left. My left is my right. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing this thing backwards. It's not them. It's me. So that's one thing. So understanding if you're having repetitive experiences. The other way that you know you need some help is something that, you know, Courtney uh, B. Vance just wrote about for men. Him. What he wrote about for men, he just released his book called The Invisible Ache. Ooh. And he wrote about it from a masculine perspective, but the same is true for women. You, Most of us have an invisible ache, mm -hmm. something that we've just accepted that this is just the way it's going to be. That's right. I, you know, I can't do no better. And it still hurts us. Yeah. So if you've got this longing, this emptiness, this ache that you come to accept as a part of your being, you know that there's some work you need to do. Baby, this is Kiki Palmer, yeah. Is it really that there will be no suffering and there will be no ache or is there just your different relationship to it? Well, your relationship to it. Mm -hmm. you, when the ache, you don't want the ache to lead your life. <laughs> you don't let the ache drive you. You know, don't let the ache drive you. you know, all, I mean, we're here. When you get it all done, Kiki, you exhale, you don't inhale, you out. So I'm glad I still got some jacked up parts of myself. <laughs> right, right. That's what I'm saying. I think that's so. I think that's so important. I remember I was having a conversation like that with somebody, and it's like, you know, I. That's why it's so weird, right? When we have these conversations like so-and-so is toxic and so-and-so is never going to change or, you know, so-and-so, you know, this is what it means. when it, it, it just seems like, well, who's perfect really? You know, and I think that also becomes a thing too where I had the same conversation with Dr. Drew and that's why I was also excited to talk to you and get your perspectives on it of what do you believe is really 
possible when it comes to change and growth? Because if we all are imperfect, then what is the difference of an imperfect person that is doomed? Like, what is this doomed concept for people? Well, I don't believe in that. See, here's why we're not doomed, Kiki. When you're ready to see it, you'll see it. And when you're ready to do it, you'll do it. And that moment is when it hurts you bad enough, you will move your behind. Until then, you just going to whine and complain and attack and accuse. But when you're ready to see it, you'll see it. And when it hurts you bad enough, you do something about it. Otherwise, you'll just stay there. I guess the other part about it, too, is the, the other part that can be difficult is accepting that other people are doomed. You know, I think it's it's so much other easier. Other people are doomed? Or it's no, doomed. they're not. They may not be ready. See, healing, mm -hmm. unfolding, growing, it's really all about maturing. Okay. And we all mature at different rates. Mm -hmm. And then we have this, we have this thing, this human thing. I don't know what you want to call it. It's part of the ego mm -hmm. that we think all the chairs in the room are equal and they're not. Mm -hmm. So you may be sitting in an A student chair. And your mother may be sitting in a C student chair. Mm -hmm. And your, your, boy, your brother or your boyfriend, your girlfriend, they may be sitting in a B plus chair. All the chairs are not equal, but everybody's in the chair they need to be in. But if you're in the A chair and you look and you say, mm, them C people, they ain't got their stuff. What is wrong with them? And then the D people are looking up and saying, oh, I shouldn't be here. I need to be in the H. You know, comparing and competing. No, you're in the chair that you need to be in based on your readiness, your willingness, and your commitment to change chairs. Got to be ready. Got to be I ready. Not Some... on my watch. That's what that game is. <laughs> you remember you gotta... that? Yeah, I remember that. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. I love so that. So nobody is doomed. Everybody is on their own curriculum that will unfold according to their readiness, their willingness, and their commitment. So do you believe that it's trauma that's central to addressing and overcoming trauma, or is that just one of them? That's just one of them. I think what is central to all of our healing is our ability to begin within. I don't care what is going on in your life. What does that mean, our ability to begin within? within? It's inside of you. And whatever is going on out here, whatever is going on out here uh, is a function of what you need to clean up in here. Yeah. I, I know I have to let you go. I'm just so devastated about it. But because I there's OK, so I'm going to just try to get this one last one out. I want to ask you, what do you think about the phrase? Everything happens for a reason. Everything does happen for a reason. Everything is absolutely purposeful in the unfolding of our spiritual curriculum that leads us to mental, emotional, and spiritual maturity. Everything happens for a reason. Everything. And even if that reason is to show you where you're not willing, where you're not ready, where you made a poor choice, a bad decision, and love yourself anyway. Because no matter what you go through, at the end of the day, you're going to be there with you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you the one that's going to have to get you through it. The therapist can help. The preacher can help. Your mama can help. But eventually, you are the only one that's going to get you through it. So there's a purpose. You're maturing. You're unfolding. There are things, you know, like when I was 20, to be without a man, uh, you know, that, um, you know, I broke out in a rash. At 70, I get to choose. You're 70? Oh, yeah. Every day. No. But I get to choose. I'm single by choice. Period. I'm single by choice. So, but I couldn't have done that at 20. At 30, you know, if I thought my partner was cheating, forget the rash. I break out in hives. At 70, <laughs> listen, you want your little side piece so that you don't have to bother me every day? Go on. I'm I'm happy for you. Go do that. I'm here for that. I'm here for that because please do not bother me. Please do not bother me. Do what you got to do for you, okay? Oh, my gosh. Inala, I cannot thank you enough for coming on our show and offering this wisdom. And I really feel like I didn't even get 
into every little bit and crux of what I want to talk to you about. I feel like we just scratched the surface, so I hope that we can do it again sometime. Um, but before I let you go, you know, we like to end our episodes with a quick game. Today, the game is the gag is where I'm going to read you a common phrase we hear about therapy and relationships. And you're going to tell me your honest and possibly unpopular opinion on the subject. You ready? Okay. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now, I just want to make it clear that these are not my opinions. These are just opinions we tend to hear. So here we go. I don't have any interest in therapy because I want to live in the future, not dwell in the past. But the gag is. You crazy as hell. That's why. You don't want to see your crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everyone has a soulmate, but the gag is. You are it. Ooh. Therapy isn't for everyone, but the gag is. It's only for those people that want to know themselves better and be better as themselves. Ooh. I wish that everyone was like this. Anyway, relationships must be 50-50 in order to be successful, but the gag is. That if you put 50% in a relationship, that's what you're going to get out. <laughs> Ooh. I love that because I'm 100% with everything I do. Yes. <clears throat> if you love someone enough, you can always make it work. But the gag is. If it ain't working, it ain't working. And love ain't going to make it work. What's love got to do? Okay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> People can never really get over trauma. But the gag is. That's an absolute lie. If someone was once a liar or manipulator in the relationship, they'll always be that way. But the gag is. I won't know about it because they will be gone from my life. <laughs> Iyala, I really love you. It's been a dream of mine to talk to you. One of my favorite episodes of Iyala Fix My Life <clears throat> because I think there's so much. Um, um, What's the word that I, I Googled about it? it was, there's so much. um child on child molestation oh, yeah. which i think is so the marvy twins yes the whole family do you remember the whole family oh, yeah. and yeah. how some of them went to foster care some of them didn't and they all came back together but then there was like abuse between the brothers and you got them to talk about it to apologize to one another and you know i i feel like that is the type of deep shadow work that sometimes humans don't even really want to face like mm -hmm. it's the kind of stuff that you know, people just don't want to touch. We haven't been taught yeah. how to have the conversation about it. Yeah. It's a power up, power down, right mm -hmm. and wrong scenario that we've been taught. You know, somebody in power talks down to you. And when you don't have the power, you can't talk up to Bauer. That's how our society is built. And right and wrong, you know, the judgment of that. And no place in this society are we taught how to have heart-centered, authentic conversations that allow us to be safe with yeah. sharing. Where, where are you safe to say, you, you know, the adults in my life forced me to have sex with my brother. They watched me. And listen, we put that story on Fix My Life because they were willing. There are thousands, hundreds of yeah. thousands of them. But if people don't feel safe... If they feel they're going to be judged, they and they have they lack the skill. They I lack just remember the skill. I remember that brother having literally physical, physical carrying a physical trauma. Yes. Like you could see physically see it in his. I think he said he was going blind and one. I like there were so many things. Yeah. That holding on to that trauma. But anyway, I just I just really wanted to I wanted to mention that particular episode because. It was really impactful to me. And it was really, um, I think, courageous of those people. I don't know where they are now, but yeah. I just remember wishing that I just could know them because I thought, wow, they really did, they really did it for themselves. They really had this conversation. And I just thought it was really, really awesome to see. Well, look, I think the greatest thing that came out, out of that, I don't know if you remember several episodes later, we got the mother came on. And the biggest thing that came out of that was that they were reunited with their mother. So some of them are doing really well. Some of them are not doing so well because I've kept in touch. How is with the young man doing? How is the young man doing? The one that I, the, the, 
The oldest one, William. No, the younger one that was physically kind of impaired. The one that him. still having a lot of physical challenges. Still right. having a lot of physical challenges. The thing that saves him is that he's so so willing. But you know, the body is also. We have trauma in the mind. We have it in the, in the heart. And then the body gets programmed. So, you know, and traditional wow. medicine doesn't deal with our spiritual and emotional wounds. It, you know, it prescribes pharmaceuticals to, to deal with the physicality. But he's he's doing okay. I mean, he's he's okay, but he's got he's got a lot, a long way to go. I just gotta talk to you. We gotta have another conversation because you well, uh I love you. <laughs> you can call me anytime. Thank Anytime. you so, 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 so much. Seriously. Thank you so much. And I hope that um, you continue to grow, unfold. And I'm waiting to see you on the screen again. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And seriously, thank you for your time. Thank you. I really feel so inspired and grounded after that conversation. Whether I'm having a conversation with her or watching her on TV, Yanla always gives me so much to think about, but she also makes me laugh, you know what I mean? Things can get emotional depending on how deep you go. I just love when our guests give me something to consider. Uh, we're always shaking things up here. So I hope you'll join me next week too. Until we talk again, you know it's your girl. Baby, this is, this is Kiki. Oh